Let us continue where we left off in our prior lecture. We were talking about the archetypes. An archetype, as we said, is like a blueprint. And within us, within our soul, is the potential for something inconceivably glorious. But what we actually have within ourselves are all of the archetypes distorted. All of the archetypes, all of the primordial molds that we have within our soul, within our spirit, have been distorted. And because of that, we suffer. All of these imperfect archetypes, they are called our passions in Christian monasticism, in Christian contemplative traditions. In our modern era, we can simply call them egos. All of our different egotistical, contradictory, unconscious desires. Well, we have all of these blueprints within ourselves, but we have distorted them and built wrong structures. This wrong structure is the Tower of Babel, which represents our big ego. And everybody's ego contradicts and conflicts with everybody else's ego. But we have more than just a monolithic ego. We actually have a big structure with a lot of rooms. And each one of those rooms has been created imperfectly. We have many different egotistical wills and desires. We can notice this when we begin to pay attention. We notice all the contradiction within ourselves. Just from one single event, we can feel many different things all at once. And we could want to do many different things. We intend to say one thing, and then we end up saying something else to someone. Because we have confusion within ourselves. Not only have we developed all of these wrong structures, wrong patterns of behavior, wrong ways of thinking, wrong ways of feeling, wrong ways of acting. We contradict ourselves. We suffer within ourselves our inner contradiction. Well, within all of those false malformed structures, or you can say patterns of behavior, there is the original primordial mold, the original archetype, which needs to be developed in the right way. And this is possible when we destroy the false structures and we go back to the original primordial mold and work with it in the correct way. We develop all of the beauty of our soul. We flourish like a garden, like a paradise. And we become something psychologically very beautiful. And even the state of perfection can be achieved. Let us now understand what the mystery of John is. Because we are pulling from the book of John. There are more than one John in the Bible. But the word John, the name John, even today, points towards the common individual. The John Doe. Any particular person. In Latin, John is Johannes. In Greek, John is Ioannes. In Hebrew, it is Yohanan, which means Jehovah has favored. When we read in the Greek, it says John did something, it will say Ioannes. So Ioannes, there's a lot of vowels in that name. And the vowels are the way that we speak the words. It's all the sounds coming out. And the sounds are coming out of our throat. So the origin of our words, which is the activity, is in our throat. And we can even say in our mind, because the mind moves the larynx, and the larynx breathes in, or as it's breathing out, forms the words. So John represents the word in a different level. 
because his name is a name that means activity. In other words, it's all those vowels, Ioannis. So John represents, on a lower level, any particular soul. We're all, inner, from a perspective of the soul, we are all that, that activity, that Ioannis activity, the activity of the word within ourselves. And a more advanced understanding, John represents a particular level of working on oneself. It's actually a very high level. Gnostically, we understand that before you reach the stage of John, you must pass through the paths of Peter and the path of Judas. In the path of Peter, you work with the keys of heaven. Because, as is stated in the Bible, that Jesus will find, found his church on the rock, the Petros of Peter. So Peter becomes the first pope. But inside of ourselves, that path of Peter is to start with the foundation of building the inner temple, building the inner church. So this is working with those archetypes, as I just said previously. The blueprints for building our inner church. The inner church is the soul. What we have presently today is the principle of a soul. We have an infantile soul. We have a baby soul. But we need to develop that into a completed soul. And a part of that development of the completion of the soul, we also have to work with the path of Judas, which means psychological death. As in the Bible, Judas hangs himself. We constantly betray our inner Lord. Every time we act egotistically, we are Judas. We sell our inner divinity for 30 coins of silver. We do this moment by moment. Every time we harbor resentment, hate, lust, envy, any of the imperfect qualities that we have, which is a lot. We have a lot of bad qualities within ourselves. It is possible to destroy them. And that is the path of Judas, psychological death. So first we have to erect the spiritual temple. We have to build the soul. And we have to perfect that soul. This is called the path of Peter. This is the first path. This path is a type of spiritual resurrection happening inside, not physical. At the end of that path, you must then go forward even further to the path of Judas. In the path of Judas, this is the path where a type of psychological cleansing occurs, which prepares one for the path of John. The path of John is when a superior level of development occurs related with Christ, where the fully developed human being can go beyond individuality and become a host of the army of the voice, which is Christ. But this is a superior work and this is a type of work that prior to the Christian doctrine coming was extremely obscured, never spoken about. Jesus came and clarified many things, yet he still covered them in parables. He lived physically many events which allowed people to make a history out of his life in certain ways that were actually spiritual teachings that go on inside one's spirit. So the books of the New Testament are teaching simultaneously at various levels of the path. They reach a very high level for those who are prepared to understand them at that level, which is the level of receiving the Christ within, the inner Jesus or Yeshua. Yeshua means Savior. So the level of person that you must be in order to be ready to receive the Yeshua, the inner Christ, 
You first must be at the level of John. You must do a lot of inner works at the level of John. And before you can reach the level of John, you must do the work of Judas. And before you can do the work of Judas, you must do the work of Peter. At our level, at a much more basic level, we can understand these three paths in a practical way when we work on developing our virtues, developing the beautiful qualities of the soul. This is related to the path of Peter. And in the later half of this lecture, we're going to talk about the keys of Peter, becoming the witness and the servant. This is the path of Peter. When we work on eliminating our imperfections, our ego, we can say this is related to the path of Judas. It's not the more elevated path that I spoke of just prior, but it's related to it. Because any type of psychological death, of course, it's related with our inner Judas. And when we do superior efforts related to cognizant charity and sacrificing ourself for humanity at our own level, this has a relationship with the path of John. It's not the fully elevated, it's not the true path of John, but at our level we can understand it in relationship to that. So all of this gives us context, it gives us understanding of what the New Testament is really talking about and what it means when the, when the person John, John the Baptist, when things are happening to him, it's talking about a person, an initiate, an initiate of the inner wisdom at that level of John. Samael Anvior states that the word John can be broken down into the five vowels in the following way. The letters I, E, O, U, A. Or I, E, O, U, A, N. Which we pronounce E, L, O, N. The entire Gospel of John is the Gospel of the Word. Which is why at the beginning of the Gospel of John it talks about the Word, the Logos. The ancient languages are much more mantric. The ancient languages put the vowels together in ways which really that connect us to the spiritual principles within ourselves. These sounds, e a o n, vibrate different aspects of our body. This is why we sometimes will repeat them as a mantra. When you say the letter e. If you were to repeat the letter E and extend it, you'll see that it vibrates your head and is related to your pineal gland and your pituitary gland. The letter or vowel E, which is the letter E, pronounced E, you can feel that it vibrates your throat. It's related to your thyroid gland. The letter O, O, is related to your heart. When you have an emotion, a strong emotion, you'll say, oh. If you, found, if you find yourself disappointed, you might say, oh. And it's hitting you in the heart. And when you find yourself emotionally excited, you might go, oh. Because again, it's hitting you in the heart. So, oh, connects you with that heart. The vowel, ooh, which is a letter U, is related to your stomach. Your solar plexus, we call it. Ooh, sometimes when you have, when you eat something very nice, when you're kind of satisfying uh, urges, either the letter U comes out. Same with the letter M, which is related to the prostate or uterus. Mm. These are very uh, related to the lower parts of our body and can relate to instincts. But from a superior aspect, M can ground our entire body. And the final letter is S. S which is related to the sexual organs. So all of these vowels, e, a, o, um, vibrate or put into contact the various parts of our body with our divine principles. There's one more vowel there, the ah, 
which is related to the lungs. It's just simple when you go, ah, uh, you'll see it, it vibrates your lungs. So this is why John is related to the word, related to the activity, related to the different types of movements of our, of our inner energies. And when we completely become a real developed John, these, all these regions of the body are in complete contact with our inner being, our inner divinity. When you have complete contact with your inner divinity, you become a prophet, you become a, a, a teacher, because you are able to proliferate the teachings because you're in contact. So we need to put ourselves into contact. This path that we talked about, I explained the path from a very general standpoint of Peter, Judas, and John. Well, from the Old Testament, we can also understand different levels of the path. Because the Bible is always teaching different levels. And different stories or books may speak about similar levels. There, there's many, many books in the Old Testament. From the perspective of the patriarchs, the first patriarch in the Old Testament is Abraham. It's stated that Abraham descended from the city of Ur, if you read the Bible. Once again, this is understood always as a historical thing. But we must understand all of this inside, initiatically, the mystery of Abraham descending from the city of Ur. This means descending from the light, because Ur is light. That's what the you are, it's, it's, it's written as you are usually in the Bible, but it's really our, A-U-R. In the ancient Aramaic or Hebrew, Aor means light. So Abraham descended from the light. And just as, it, just as we understood from that quote of the Zohar, this appears to be a story of literal history. But that's just the outer vesture. All of these scriptures were written mostly for the for the inner meaning the literal teaching was always provisional it never represented a literal historical fact it was never meant to be taken as the ultimate meaning so all the history is mingled and is subservient to the inner mysteries which is giving a teaching So Abraham represents that which descends from the light, the first thing that descends from the light. The light we know is Christ. So Christ is a universal, impersonal force, the principle of creation. The first thing we can say that descends out of that is our inner spirit, which is Abraham. Abraham, our inner spirit, descends from the light. So our inner spirit is light but a particular ray or drop of that light coming out of the universal ocean of light. That's our inner spirit. That's Abraham. And many things happen, which we're not going to go into detail about. But primarily, the next patriarch is Isaac. So Isaac represents another unfoldment from our spirit. We call this the spiritual soul. The spiritual soul is the part of our inner being which develops wisdom, which develops gnosis. Because the spirit itself is something that is already perfect. Our inner spirit is already perfect. But there's a mystery here that that inner spirit needs to reflect its own perfection in order for the spirit to completely know its own perfection. And the way that a candle can be lit inside a glass or a vase of alabaster, the light inside is the spirit, and that very nice alabaster surrounding is glowing from that light. This is the spiritual soul. The spiritual soul takes the inner light, and if the spiritual soul is developed, 
It's very beautiful. It takes that inner light and it transforms it into something very, very beautiful. The inner light is always perfect. But when you place the perfect thing around it, it makes that light even more radiant. But that spiritual soul needs to unfold even further. That's why Isaac gives birth, among many other things, which are, again, not going to get into right now, but Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Jacob represents yet another unfolding of our soul. This is what we call the root of our human soul. Because from the spiritual soul unfolds the human soul. The thing you must understand between the human soul and the divine soul is that the human soul can do self-will. So the inner spirit is our inner light. That's Abraham. The unfoldment from Abraham is the reflective material that can make that light even more beautiful. But that sense, that aspect of the soul is divine. It always does the will of God. It is perfect in that sense. When the spiritual soul unfolds, it is just a principle. It has not been, it has not been constructed. The construction of that spiritual soul is done by the works of the human soul. The human soul has to build their inner temple. That inner temple really is the spiritual soul. But it needs to be built perfectly. It needs to be built in a way to reflect and refract that light like a diamond. What we have built with our human soul, with our human will, our animalistic will, I should even say, is we've built a mess inside of ourselves to such a degree that we don't even see our inner light anymore to such a degree that we have forgotten our inner light and we believe that we are the intellect or that we are the emotions. We are not that. Our emotions and our intellect have become trapped by our own creations. Because we've created houses of envy within ourselves, we get trapped within our own envy. And then we are always envious or our own fear and we become always fearful. If we destroy those false creations, and then work correctly through self-knowledge, through the acquirement of gnosis, we build that spiritual soul. We develop all of those archetypes perfectly. This is the job of the human soul. This is the job of Jacob. So Jacob is the third unfoldment. Now from Jacob comes a lot of things. Jacob becomes Israel. When he fights a strong angel, he succeeds. And then Israel, or Jacob, has principally 12 offspring, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. This is where the phrase comes from, 12 tribes of Israel. Those 12 tribes represent the collections of different archetypes within ourselves. But what happens is those 12 tribes of Israel become encaged or enslaved by the Egyptians, by the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh is our own ego. The Pharaoh represents the false encagement of all of our spiritual principles into slavery. So there's a lot of stories related to Jacob and Israel, and principally Joseph and Benjamin represent the very first levels of a superior development. After Joseph and Benjamin, we come across Moses and Aaron. Benjamin represents superior emotion. Aaron represents superior reasoning. And Aaron's brother is Moses. Moses is the one who does all of the works against the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh represents our egotistical will, which has trapped all of our spiritual principles. We have to liberate the Israelites and have to do a lot of works. This is the story of Moses. And after Moses... Many other books of the Bible are written. But if we, if we go from Moses, we can go all the way to the book of John. Because John really represents the next stage of the path. After you liberate all those Israelites, that's very similar as completing the works of Peter and Judas. When you complete the works of Peter and Judas, you're at the level of John. And Moses completing the extraction or liberation of all of the 
people of Israel, is more or less at that same level, ready to receive Christ. So John works in the river Jordan, and then Jesus descends to resurrect in John. So these are very symbolic teachings, very difficult to comprehend. If this is the first time you've heard all of this, you probably can only get a certain level of understanding. What's important for you to understand is that all of these teachings have a particular component of a path, what we call the path of initiation. That they are not a historical artifact, but they're actually different levels of teaching. They, they have a coherence. They have a continuity. And as you study these teachings more and, and deeper, you begin to comprehend exactly how all of those factors connect together. But for now, we'll, we'll leave it at just that basic understanding that there are levels and levels, degrees and degrees. So there's an unfoldment of the soul, and then that soul has to do a profound Gnostic work. So this is what we are always pointing towards. This is the point of our, of our life is to do the work at our own degree. It does not make sense for us to be worried about these high degrees. What, we need, what makes sense for us is to work at the level that we can. Right here and now, with our own activity that we see right here and now. That's how we begin. We begin by acknowledging the activities that are in our mind and heart and working with our psychology, in order to transform it. But of course, it's very difficult to transform our psychology. And many people try, but they feel ineffectual. They feel like they cannot achieve it. Well, this is where some of these more inner teachings come into play that tell you what you need in order to form the foundation. Because the first path we talked about was the path of Peter, which the church is founded upon, your inner church. Peter has the keys to heaven. So let us now discuss John even further, the book of John, and we'll get an inkling of understanding how these teachings can practically work in our daily life. We're going to continue with John 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So right away, We can understand all this in a a superior level. When it says there was a man, the actual word in Greek is anthropos. This is interesting because anthropos means mankind. It means the man. The word for male is not anthropos. So it says there was a man, anthropos. This anthropos is again pointing towards something. Meaning not the common everyday man or woman, but the true man. This is the man who is at that level of John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, Ioannes. So to be a true human means you have erected that inner spiritual temple and you have eliminated your ego. This is actually a very advanced work. But once again, we can understand John from a more generic aspect as any particular soul. The verse continues. The same came for a witness. So the same meaning John also came for a witness to bear witness for the light that all men through him might believe. Let us unpack this verse. The same came for a witness. The word here is martyria, which is where we get the same word for martyr. To testify, to martyr. So when we give witness, what are we martyring? What, why are these two things connected? From a Gnostic standpoint, to give witness, it is necessary to martyr your self-desires, your self egotistical will, must be martyred, must be killed. Because the truth is not our desires or our ego. 
To speak the truth, you have to martyr your ego. Then you can bear witness. Then the light, which is the truth, that spiritual principle within yourself that can now unfold. When you are stuffed full of your egotistical desires, your fears, your anxieties, your puffed up pride, all of your rationalities, beliefs, and theories, the light cannot grow inside of you. You have to give, you have to bear witness, you have to martyr your ego in order to bear witness of the light. That light is phos in Greek and aor in Aramaic or Hebrew, as we said before. The light is aor. In Hebrew as well, the word martyr or to, to testify or to be a witness, we can say in, in Hebrew is od, which is ayin dalet or od, od. That's something we're going to connect with in a little bit later. But to be a witness is Od. And it says that all men through him might believe. Believe in Greek. This goes back to the root word pistis. Pistis is not a vain belief. There's a tremendous misunderstanding and abuse of this word faith today. It is being used and has been used for quite some time to indicate a religious belief. And many people rail against religion for having blind believers. Many of those who are religious think that this blind belief, that this is the way. This faith, and the right word really is faith, is not the same thing as belief. Faith indicates that you have trust, to have confidence. There are those who state, all you need to do is say the name of the Lord, raise your hand and say you believe in him, and everything else will be done for you. That's all you need to do, is just believe. Well, we can only state that let the fruits of our works be made known. You shall know everything by their fruits. And to simply raise your hand and say you believe, and then five minutes later continue to be an unconscious mechanical being who has resentments and hatred and enmity and vitriol and bellicose posturing against others. This is a contradiction. You cannot have this faith if you have hatred inside of you. Does your hatred believe in Jesus Christ? Does your fear believe in Jesus Christ? Does your jealousy? There is no way to possess this pistis, this faith, with all of these elements within ourselves which betray the Lord, our inner Judas, which needs to be slain it's very active, working against the Lord. So we can't translate this as a vain, superficial belief. We must understand it is a, a knowledge of experience within ourselves. We gain that faith little by little, and we have it in completion when we reach that perfection. So we make this statement, faith is not the belief in something which has no evidence. Faith or pistis is powerful comprehension based upon the critical reflection of one's conscious experience. If you reflect within yourself very seriously and sincerely, you will come into contact with your inner spiritual principles, and you will have direct experience, and then you will have faith. Continuing John, He was not that light, that phos or eor, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was not in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. So coming into the world, we assume again that we're talking about a physical world. But the inner understanding is our inner world. 
which is in Greek, the word here is cosmos. Cosmos means order, to put something in order. So the inner anthropos, the inner John, comes into the ordered world, or ordered inner psychology. But the, all the other elements, the darkness within ourselves, rails against and, and doesn't understand. When we walk on this path, we have inner battles, inner tempests, which tempt us to behave otherwise. We have to work with that, to transform that. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let us now speak more to this witness, to this witnessing, in order to understand the keys that Peter holds, which is how we begin to build our inner church. In Isaiah 41, it's written, For I beheld, and there was no man even among them, and there was no counselor that, when I asked of them, could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. The molten images that are wind and confusion are our egotistical desires. This is the false idolatry that occurred when Moses went up the mountain and all the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain created a golden idol from their earrings and other jewelry. This represents taking our spiritual principles, which are those golden attributes that we have within ourselves, to create molten images, false idols. People think that false idols is some external thing, some statue you worship. But the false idol that's being spoken about here are the molten images we have created within ourselves. The ideas. Those molten images. We think we're so good. We're such wonderful people. That we're such a martyr. Those molten images that we cower from. We're afraid. We have fear and anxiety. Hatred and pride. Lust. These are our molten images that we are subservient to because we gave up our spiritual principles. In the end, we can get no counsel from them. In the end, we get nothing but dust back from them. We feel naked and miserable in life. We have no answers. We don't know where to turn to. Because their molten images are nothing more than wind and confusion. This is the description of our mind at the moment. Continuing, Isaiah 42 states, in distinction to the previous verse that we read, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment to the truth. Here we have the word servant, which is, sounds very similar to witness. Witness was od, od, ayin delet. Servant is ayin bet delet, obd. So servant and witness, very similar. Obd and od, or I should say od and obd. Od is witness, obd is servant. So this is the servant. And the servant shall not break a bruised reed, nor the smoking flax shall he quench. So a reed, you'll find in all the scriptures and all the religions, a staff of the wise man, of the staff of the patriarchs, the staff of Moses. This staff represents 
the power of the of divinity that power rides or it seats itself within us when we do the spiritual work it seats within us up and down the spinal column it is obvious that all of the primary energies and critical functions of our human body our physical body go up and down the spinal column it should be no surprise that the primary conduits also go up and down the spinal column, which give us that active connection to our inner divinity. And the symbol of this is the staff, or the reed, which you find in many places in the Bible. A bruised reed indicates a spinal column which has no spiritual connection because the works that bring that spiritual connection have been lost or they have not been done. This servant shall not break that bruised reed. In other words, it will heal that bruised reed. When we have the active energy flowing, this is like having gasoline in a car engine. Now the engine can work. If you have a cell phone or a mobile device that has no energy in it, no battery, it cannot run. So we must understand that physically we may be very alive and physically fit or healthy. But spiritually, what gives us spiritual life is particular types of behaviors based primarily on those ethical behaviors that we were speaking about in the beginning of the lecture. That is why it is so important to have these ethical behaviors because it forms a basis for the energy in our body to connect with our soul and our spirit, the inner light. Finally, third quote from Isaiah 43. You are my witness, Od, saith Yod He Vav He, which is usually translated as Jehovah. You are my witness, saith Yod He Vav He, and my servant. You are my witness and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, that these are the faces of your understanding before me, El, the inner God, was not formed, neither shall he become after me. I, even I, am yod vav and Ayin, as part of me, is one Savior. There's a very cryptic, Kabbalistic phrase here that goes beyond the explanations that we're having in this lecture. What we're primarily concerned with here is the witness and the servant. The witness is O-D. The servant is O-B-D. These two are explained in different ways in the Bible. Peter is often depicted holding two keys. And many times there's one gold key and one silver key. These two keys, we can say, are the symbols of the witness and the servant. Continuing on with our understanding of the witnesses, Because sometimes it's called the two witnesses. Sometimes it's called the witness and the servant. This is all pointing towards the same symbol. So remember, we read just a a quote before about the reed. And jumping to Revelation, which is the end of the Bible. Revelation 11 reads, And there was given to me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship them. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Let us unpack this and explain how it relates to everything we've been talking about. There was given to me a reed unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. We've been speaking about the inner archetypes that need to be developed into our inner church, our inner temple. 
and that is measured upon the reed. And the reed represents our spinal column. The greater that measurement, the greater the degree that energy is flowing through that reed. If you look at a bamboo reed, for example, you'll see that there's pockets. Each one of those uh, divisions is like a cell. There's like a, a pocket, and then there's on top of that, there's another pocket. And it almost is similar, similar to the different vertebrae on our spine. So as the energy is purified, the principles are making a deeper and more profound connection related to our spinal column. And we develop in, in symbolism the other understanding is as we develop that energy, we are developing our inner temple. But the court which is without the temple, leave them out, meaning don't let your ego in. They're not for the temple. What's meant for the temple are inner archetypes developed in the light. And it says, I will give power to my two witnesses. This again is martyria. And they shall prophesy. And then it says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. So it's, it's stating that the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. The Gnostic understanding here becomes a little bit more obvious when you investigate the two olive trees. This in Greek is duo el aia. Duo is two. El aia means olives. So it's often translated as two olive trees. But more literally, it's the two olives. If I were to tell you that you must take care of your two olives because they're very delicate, and you need to take care of your olives. Make sure they don't get harmed. They're very important. You may, using your imagination, understand that those two olives represent the gonads. Two testicles or the two ovaries. These are our two olives. Those two olives, of course, if you know how to work with the two olives, you get olive oil. This oil represents our base energy related to sex. Depending on how we use that oil is very important because remember the word Christos, Christ, it means fire and light, but the literal meaning is anointed one. And what you anoint one with is oil. So these are the two olive trees, the two olives, the two candlesticks, the duo lucina. This duo, again, duo is two. Lucina is, is the thing that creates light, the candlestick before the God of the earth. When we say the God of the earth, we're talking about the lower manifestation of God, God within ourself. Certainly, we need to make these greater and more developed connections to our inner spirit, but God exists everywhere. Within ourselves, it does exist within our body. But it's stating here the two witnesses are like two olives, two candlesticks. Let us, before we completely unveil all this, let us now go to Zechariah 4, which is in the Old Testament. It stated, And I raised my voice and said to him, What are these two olives, which is Zaith, on the right of the candelabrum and on its left? So we're already talking about the two olives and the two candlesticks. One on the left side and one on the right side. And I raised my voice a second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches, Shibol Zaith, beside the two golden vats that empty out the gold from themselves? Gold is Zahab. And he spoke to me, saying, You do not know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones, Yitshar, who stand before the Lord, Adon, or Adani, of the earth, Aretz. So you can see a complete parallel between Revelation and Zechariah. The last verse is the, almost the exact same thing. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's Revelation. 
Zechariah says, And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of all the earth. The anointed ones. And to be anointed in Greek is Christos. To be anointed, you're being anointed with what? That olive. Those olives, the olive oil. If you read more, Zechariah is about the oil going up the candlesticks, up to the top. And that oil, which is the golden oil, like olive oil, the symbol of that olive oil is a symbol of an energy going from the earth up into heaven, from the bottom of the candlestick, from the bottom of the reed, up on the left side and on the right side, up to the top, which is in heaven, or we say symbolically in our head. The energy going from the, from the bottom of the spine, traveling up to the top to the head and from there the light shines and this is the halo of saints this is the fire atop the apostles in the book of acts this energy goes from the bottom to the top but you have to know the inner teachings those who know how to get that energy transform that energy from the bottom to make it rise up the candlesticks to the top know the true essence of Gnosticism, of Gnosis. And anybody who doesn't know how to do that has not been initiated into the true Gnostic teachings. Because without this, you cannot be a witness or a servant. To be a witness and to be a servant of the Lord is to be a transformer of energy. Because within ourselves is an inner fire. And that fire, we can see, is very present in our physical body. Very strong sexual nature. And we have only understood that from an instinctual animal level. And from a material standpoint, everybody believes that they are just nothing more than an animal with intellect. And that sex is just our animal side. Certainly, there's a level of sexuality related to being an animal. But the whole point of religion, specifically the Gnostic teachings, is to transform that instinct into intuition. Because inside that fire is a light which transforms us. And an energy which is the thing that can create and build the inner temple within ourselves. Because our creative sexual energy is something that can create. But we've only understood this in a way to create physical, to create physically. But the teaching state, that you can refine that energy, keeping it within the body and transforming it up the spine. It's an energetic transformation that's not related to the three-dimensional physical body. So these two candlesticks, these two witnesses, or the witness and the servant, are two primary energetic channels that stand before the Lord of the earth. We state that the right side is solar, and this is related to the gold key of Peter. And we state that the left side is lunar, and this is related to the silver key of Peter. And knowing how to work with our energies, the solar and the lunar, is how we have the two keys to heaven, and how we build our inner temple on the foundation stone of our sexual creative power. When we take our inner energy and extract the spiritual principle, we are like an alchemist transforming the base metal into gold. What we extract out of there is an energy, a power, and a wisdom. It gives us the power to slay our enemies. Those enemies are our psychological defects, our psychological imperfections within ourself. And it gives the wisdom of good and evil. Because when we do our egotistical self-will, we gain knowledge of evil, knowledge of defilement, knowledge of our imperfection. And when we rectify ourselves and we destroy our ego and build the soul within ourselves, we begin to acquire the knowledge of good. So there is a reason as to why priests and monks and always the religious ordained individual had to protect their sexual energy. 
And today this is translated as celibacy, that you must not do anything with that energy. So there is a real reason why it is necessary to protect your sexual energy, to work with it correctly. Because if you always eject it from your body through orgasm or ejaculation, you're literally ejecting the spiritual principles and the power to transform your psychology. Because the fundamental basis, the foundation of your psychology is your sexual behavior. Nothing is more important than that. That is the foundation of your mind, is your sex. So this is the reason why taking care of your sexual energy is so important. However, the modern understanding is to just be celibate and to totally reject in a very blind way, in a very superficial and blunt way, to reject sex. And what happens if you reject sex in a very blunt, blind way, you just end up repressing all of that egotistical activity. And the result is what we've seen, unfortunately, today, all of the crimes against children, of priests doing horrendous things to children, because they have not comprehended their sexual nature. They've only repressed it. So to keep your sexual energy is only good if you know how to work with it properly. That oil has to rise up to the head to enlighten the world, to blossom the rose of your heart. This develops the soul. But today, the teachings have become lost and degenerated. We need to know how to work with that energy. We need to know how to examine the activity of our mind and our heart to get to the origin, to expose our imperfections in the light, to destroy our imperfections, to develop our inner soul. We do this through the work of sexual transmutation and psychological transformation. They work together. Obviously, there's much more to be stated about how to work with this oil how to work with the two witnesses, with the witness and the servant. We're going to continue to elaborate and clarify these teachings in our following lectures.